people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Shivangi Mishra with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. The unprecedented reception of PM Modi at the White House to a swanky state dinner, the Washington White spoke volumes about the direction US-India ties are headed in. From trade to tech, from diplomacy to drones, and from climate change to Chinese conduct in the Indo-Pacific, the historic Modi-Biden summit delivered on almost everything. One thing became crystal clear during PM Modi's state visit to the US and there are no ifs, ands or buts about it. The India-US duo has hit the accelerator and their solid commitment to join forces across fields is an indicator that this partnership is going to be a real powerhouse. Join us as we discuss how India and the US, the two biggest global democracies with shared interests and ambitions, can become two of the greatest allies. As Prime Minister Narendra Modi touched down on American soil, the air was thick with anticipation and excitement. Exuberance and elation reached their pinnacle by the time the visit reached its epic conclusion. In what was one of the biggest highlights of the visit, U.S. congressmen lined up to take Prime Minister Modi's autograph and click selfies. They also chanted his name exactly like the roaring crowds do at his rallies back in India and accorded him multiple standing ovations during his speech. Straight from the heart of the oldest democracy, Prime Minister Modi dropped some truth bombs on the global stage and urged the global community to make much needed amendments throughout multilateral institutions. Many, including the United States, have in the past rallied behind the idea of giving India a greater role in global institutions, including a permanent place on the UN Security Council. We must revive multilateralism and reform multilateral institutions with better resources and representation that applies to all our global institutions of governance, especially the United Nations. When the world has changed, our institutions too must change or risk getting replaced by a world of rivalries without rules in working for a world, new world order based on international law. Our two countries will be at the forefront as partners. Prime Minister Modi's tour featured a packed schedule of activity and success making it one of the busiest and most fruitful visits the Prime Minister has had in recent years. From the big picture of pressing global issues to the nitty-gritty of trade and tech, nothing was off the agenda. Observers believe that India and the United States are uniquely placed in the global order to tackle global challenges with relative ease and a greater impact. It is the result of rising Indian respect and growing trust in her abilities that an increasing number of business bigwigs across different industries have expressed interest in joining the Indian bandwagon. They recognize the country's remarkable progress and the opportunities she presents for innovation and technological advancement. It was a, a fantastic meeting with the Prime Minister and um, uh, I, 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 I like him quite a lot. I can say he, um, he's, he's, he really wants to do the right thing for India. I am a fan of Modi, so. <laughs> As expected, India sealed some significant deals in the defense sector. 
MQ-9Bs with their enhanced ISR capabilities will now be assembled in India. As part of this plan, General Atomics will also establish a comprehensive global MRO facility in India to support India's long-term goals to boost indigenous defense capabilities. General Electric and Hindustan Aeronautics Limited, or HAL, have joined hands for the manufacturing of GE F414 jet engines in India for the HAL Light Combat Aircraft MK2. This game-changing move to manufacture F414 engines in India will enable the greater transfer of U.S. jet engine technology more than ever before. India and the U.S. have committed to working collaboratively and expeditiously to support the advancement of this unprecedented co-production and technology transfer proposal. The U.S. hasn't been apprehensive in providing India the tech it needs to enhance her capabilities, as Washington knows for sure that India, the true advocate and promoter of peace, is the most reliable bet it can have in the entire world. We're straightforward with each other and, uh, and we respect each other. One of the fundamental reasons that I believe the U.S.-China uh, relationship is not in the space it is in the U.S.-Indian relationship is that uh, there is an overwhelming respect for each other because we're both democracies. The two countries will now be integrating at the U.S.-India Defense Acceleration Ecosystem, IndusX as well. As a network of universities, startups, industry and think tanks, IndusX will facilitate joint defense technology innovation and co-production of advanced defense technology between the respective industries of the two countries. Whether it is innovation, research, defense, physics, medicine, drone, or automobiles, present-day India is one of the most favorable markets in the world. India's foreign policy, which is primarily driven by her people-centric principles, has added to her case. Industry leaders have opined time and time again that India's potential for investment, research and development, and market expansion is immense and she is the hotbed of opportunities for those aiming big. India's growth speed, coupled with extraordinary ability to make up for lost years and decades, speaks volumes about the nation's potential and resilience. Her diplomatic leaps that have propelled her to become one of the most emphatic and resolute players in the current global climate have also been one of the key reasons behind the world being drawn to her. Brand India, which was known for its soft power until a few years ago, is swiftly expanding its influence in other arenas as well, making itself a multi-dimensional powerhouse which cannot be ignored. Two great friends, two great nations, and two great powers. Cheers. Moving on. Risking everything from little they accrued from years of savings to even their lives. The desperate youth of Pakistan are fleeing their homeland in search of brighter prospects abroad. Cash-strapped Pakistan's $350 billion economy is in a meltdown, with inflation at a record 38%, a rapidly depreciating currency and external deficit led the government to adopt drastic measures over the past year to avoid default, but this has only worsened its case. A large chunk of those who even aspire a decent lifestyle are forced to see beyond countries' borders and while some make to their dream destinations, others meet a fate they never imagined. After spending more than 20 years working successfully in Saudi Arabia, Hamid Iqbal Bhatti returned to Pakistan three years ago and found himself in a dire situation. Due to the pandemic's negative effects on the economy, his restaurant was forced to close. The 47-year-old scrapped together $7,600 to pay a trafficker to bring his brother Mohammed Sarwar Bhatti into Europe where he planned to rebuild the life he previously had. As work, opportunities dried up and sky-high inflation destroyed his budget. One of the deadliest migrant tragedies in recent years occurred last week 
when a boat carrying Hamid Bhatti and hundreds of others from Libya capsized off the coast of Greece. According to his brother, he is among a large number of Pakistanis who are missing and assumed dead, underscoring the dangers that those who attempt to enter Europe illegally confront. The ongoing economic crisis in Pakistan has led to an increase in the number of people travelling there. खुशहाल कौन अपने घर से निकलता है कि जो एक टाइम था इन बच्चों को जो मुंह से निकालते थे जो पहनने को इनका दिल करता था खाने को दिल करता था वो सब कुछ प्रोवाइड करते थे लेकिन ये तीन साल से जो दिन ब दिन दिन ब दिन सो उनके लिए जहनी परेशानी भी बना हुआ था कि कल क्या होगा हमारा Cash trapped with inflation at a record 38%, Pakistan's 350 billion dollar economy is in complete collapse. Over the past year, the government has taken extreme measures to prevent default due to a rapidly appreciating currency and an external deficit. However, that came with a significant hit to development and employment. The industrial sector is forecast to have shrunk by about 3% in the current fiscal year which is problematic for a country of 230 million people that adds more than 2 million people to the labor force every year Ishtiaq Ahmed a businessman who spent 11 years working in Oman said he regretted returning home to Gujarat last year to launch his own auto parts company Pakistan is one of the leading exporters of labor and remittances have contributed to the survival of the nation. According to official data, there were approximately 830,000 people registered as foreign workers last year, which was the most since 2016. ਸਾਡੇ ਮੁਲਕ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਰੋਜ਼ਗਾਰ ਨਹੀਂ। ਅਗਰ ਰੋਜ਼ਗਾਰ ਹੋਵੇ, ਫਿਰ ਜਨਤਾਂ ਦੇ ਬਕੋਲ ਕੋਈ ਵੀ ਨਹੀਂ ਜਾਏਗਾ। ਠੀਕ ਹੈ। ਇੱਥੇ ਹੀ ਬੰਦੇ ਕਾਰੋਬਾਰ ਕਰਨਗੇ। ਰੋਜ਼ਗਾਰ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੈ ਬੰਦੇ ਰੋਟੀ ਖਾਣ ਤੋਂ ਤੰਗ ਨੇ ਇਸ ਵਜ੍ਹਾ ਤੋਂ ਫਿਰ ਕਹਿੰਦੇ ਨੇ ਕਿ ਇਹਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਅੱਛਾ ਕਿ ਅਸੀਂ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਨਾ ਜਾਂ ਪਹੁੰਚ ਜਾਾਂਗੇ ਜਾਂ ਰਸਤੇ ਚ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਨਾ ਮਰ ਜਾਾਂਗੇ The 102 detentions of irregular migrants at the European Union's external border between January and May was 12% higher than the previous year and the most since 2016. according to frontex the blocks border and coast guard agency this is the situation on ground and pakistan's present situation doesn't give any hope either despite a number of them returning home after having lost all their money and other few losing their lives the desperate pakistani youth is not deterred and is ready to set off on another voyage Time now for Asia to speak the stories from across the continent. Israeli settlers rampaged through Palestinian towns in the West Bank killing at least one person, critically injuring another and torching buildings and cars. The attacks appear to be retaliation for the killing by the Islamist group that rules Gaza Hamas of four Israelis near a settlement the day before. Clashes erupted between Palestinians and settlers. West fire engines rushed to the town to put out the flames and residents tried to clean up the damage. The Israeli military said troops had entered to Musaya to put out fires and prevent clashes and it said Israeli civilians had left the town. It also condemned the violence in a statement. So far this year 174 Palestinians most of them militants but several of them civilians have been killed by Israeli forces at the same time 24 Israelis and one foreigner have been killed in attacks by Palestinians in the West Bank around Jerusalem and in some Israeli cities A passenger ferry carrying 120 passengers and crew members caught fire off the coast of the Central Philippines last Sunday, Philippine Coast Guard officials said. A Coast Guard vessel was deployed to extinguish the flames and rescue people on board. Visuals from the Philippine Coast Guard showed parts of the ferry engulfed in flames while its personnel tried to hose down the flames. 
All 120 people on board have been accounted for and no casualties were reported, Coast Guard officials added. Moving on. The unexpected news of the IMF loan rejection has struck an already devastated Pakistan with jolting disbelief. With Pakistan now losing 6 billion US dollars from its future plans, a monumental fiscal tragedy has hit the Shahbaz Sharif government, which was already grappling with a multifaceted crisis of record inflation, monetary imbalances, and low forex reserves. The loan rejections also come in the run up to the general elections further complicating the already chaotic political landscape. Join us as we discuss the ramifications of the IMF's loan rejection for Pakistan, a country already tittering on economic, political and social collapse. Pakistan announced one of its most anticipated budgets earlier this month. The budget was the final opportunity for the Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif-led government to appeal to the public before the country goes to the polls later this year. It was also imperative for the government to incorporate measures aimed at bringing the ailing economy back on track. The IMF conditions were to be met. Structural reforms were expected. However, the budget presented a stark contrast. Neither did it satisfy the common Pakistan man or woman, nor the global lender. Given the mood of the IMF and uh, the international financial markets, I don't think anybody is ready to cut any slack for Pakistan right now. Unless, of course, some major geopolitical event takes place, uh, you know, like what has happened in the past, uh, whether it was 9-11, before that the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, something, uh, you know, at a mega scale takes place where Pakistan once again, you know, uh, becomes uh, a, a player in the international system. Otherwise, it's a marginal country. Uh, it only has nuisance value uh, because of its nuclear weapons. In what experts believe could have been a better target with tight spending measures, Pakistan has set a fiscal deficit target of 6.54%, slightly lower than the current deficit of 7%. In addition to this, Pakistan increased subsidies and gave an unexpected salary hike to government employees, leaving the IMF dissatisfied and the informal and private sector furious. Civil servants in Pakistan will get a 35% hike and state pensions will be 17% higher. Pakistan is paying money to people that it doesn't even have. Pakistan entered into a deal in 2019, according to which the IMF was supposed to give 6.5 billion USD to Pakistan. Out of this, 1.1 billion USD is still undispersed. This deal will expire at the end of June. Pakistan's crumbling situation is screaming for this tranche of the bailout. Cash-strapped Pakistan will spend 50.4 billion USD, of which 50% of it, which is USD 25 billion, will be on debt service. 13% of which, 6 billion USD, has been allocated to defense. Pakistan is facing a balance of payment crisis. Its currency has plunged into a downward spiral. The dollar reserves are dwindling. There's an energy crisis and inflation is skyrocketing. However, the government seems to have different priorities altogether. This is the country they have created. I mean, it has been commented in the past that most countries have an army. In Pakistan, an army has a country. So as long as the equation of power doesn't change, the flow of uh, uh, funding will also not change. You must also understand that it's not just the army. Pakistan remains a overwhelmingly feudal society. The army is one f element of that feudal structure. So, they, the country lives for a very small elite. The people don't matter. The country's economy, which was struggling for months, is now facing another major challenge as a protracted political war between the government and Imran Khan, which has already taken a massive socio-economic and political toll on the country, is not seemingly ceasing anytime soon. The tragic comedy storyline of Pakistan is also featuring upcoming elections. 
The more pressing question here is, can Pakistan even bear the burden of holding elections? Critics say the country has no choice but to proceed with the scheduled elections. Abandoning this plan will do nothing to disavow the notion that civilian authorities are operating under the influence of the army. The IMF has criticized the budgeting of the bankrupt economy as insufficient to accomplish the goals of its bailout program. This signals that the IMF may not give the last tranche to Pakistan. The current government seems to be targeting in the dark. With Pakistan's existing problems and the complex political economy, the produced budget is a meaningless document. Our mind is always buzzing with thoughts and our body is struggling with daily hassles. Achieving stability, peace and tranquility is a task. Yoga, one of the world's oldest sciences that originated in India, can provide you with spiritual healing by arousing awareness of your physical, mental and emotional experiences. International Yoga Day was celebrated all over the world, echoing unity, well-being and harmony. Have a look. Humanity has accomplished wonders in the world. Our penetrating ambitions are unveiling the mysteries of the universe. Our mind and body always stay entangled in the outer world, making it difficult for us to stay in peace. The sages of ancient India invented a technique to keep mind and body in equilibrium. Observations, postures, breath control and meditations are limbs of this technique. This practice is called yoga. These scenes are from different corners of India. Thousands of people from all walks of life actively participated in the International Day of Yoga. People went to playgrounds and open spaces and performed various asanas. From beginners to yogis, from basic to advanced, everyone was seen practicing yoga. सभी ग्राउंड पे तो करते हैं पर हमने पानी में किया आज विश्व योगा दिन है 21 जून तो पानी में हम लोग 20 25 दिनों से प्रैक्टिस तो कर ही रहे थे और आज हमने सभी ने यहां पे अलग-अलग योगा किए अलग-अलग आसन किए पानी में और बहुत अच्छा भी लगता है ये पानी में टेकिंग इंडियाज कल्चरल डिप्लोमेसी अ स्टेप फर्दर प्राइम मिनिस्टर नरेंद्र मोदी सेलिब्रेटेड इंटरनेशनल योगा डे at the United Nations headquarters in New York, setting a Guinness World Record for the largest number of nationalities participating in a yoga session. PM Modi propagated the message of Yoga for Vasudev Kutumbakam, which translates as Yoga for the welfare of all as the one world, one family. Let us use the power of yoga not only to be healthy, happy but also to be kind to ourselves and to each other. Let us use the power of yoga to build bridges of friendship, a peaceful world and a cleaner, cleaner and sustainable future. Let us join hands together to realize the goal of one earth, one family, one future. Bending and twisting the body has physical benefits, but yoga is not limited to this. It has a profound positive effect on strengthening parts of the brain that play key roles in memory, awareness, attention and thoughts. Yoga is India's precious export. It has power to unify body, mind and soul. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care. People have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect.